Today on Sports Card Investor, we're sitting down with the GOAT, Dr. James Beckett, to talk about the future of the sports card hobby. My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me on my journey to profit from the hobby we all love. Sports card investors, and welcome to another episode. A great episode because the GOAT is coming on the show. You know that Dr. James Beckett was the founder of Beckett Media and Beckett Grading, the original price guide guy, one of the pioneers of the hobby, and somebody who has a great perspective on where the hobby is going and where it has been. So it's awesome to sit down and and talk with him like we did during the virtual holiday sports card con earlier this month. And I pulled that interview out so you could watch it again today because it's a really, really good one. And while Dr. Beckett has a great perspective on where things have been and where things are going, you can have a great perspective as well if you download the free sports card investor app from the App Store, App Store, because the Sports Card Investor app is full of great content, articles, videos, as well as a look of, at all of the trending cards updated every single day, so you can see which cards are getting hot and how cards are changing in price every single day. It's also, by the way, the best and easiest way to shop for sports cards with great buy now listings. Best of all, it's all free. All you have to do is go to the app store on your phone and search for sports card investor. Go do that right now. Trust me, you're going to love this app. And you're also going to love this interview with Dr. Beckett. So let's get right into it. And please welcome Dr. James Beckett to Sports Card Investor. Dr. Beckett, it is an honor to have you back on the virtual Sports Card Con. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Glad to be here. Absolutely. And last time uh, when we had you on, we spent some time talking about your history of starting Beckett and of course Beckett's growth to becoming a company that's so well known in the hobby that it's almost, uh, you know, you can't, you can't say the word the hobby without also thinking of Beckett, you know, how interlinked they are. I, I, without revisiting the whole history again, I'm curious, because uh, I always love asking entrepreneurs this question who have, who have built something great like you've built. When was it along the journey that you thought to yourself, hot damn, I've got something here. You know, I've, I've, I've turned this into something. I've made this. I love doing these interviews where I don't really know exactly what the question is and it's framed in a slightly different way. And so I contemplate it and come up with a different answer. Still the truth, but a different aspect of it. And I, if I go back, you know, your first comment, Jeff, was, you know, I was always well known in the hobby. It's just that the hobby got bigger. <laughs> and I was in the thick of it really from the beginning, even uh, probably in the early 70s. But uh, I thought about some several different, the, the easy answer that I gave in one of my uh, podcasts was that the turning point was in 79 when the first book came out and it was an immediate sellout. And I thought, you know what? I've got it made. I, I'd... Uh, I'd uh, achieved tenure. I'd earned tenure at a university. I, I really enjoyed the students. I enjoyed my fellow professors, had a great life, was single at that point, had a great collection. And the first Price Guide book was an immediate hit. And I knew I'd made it. But that's the answer I've given in the past. You've helped me to construct a better answer. And that is that in 1969, 1979 wouldn't have happened if I had gotten my cards and sold them to Gervis Ford because I was dating a gal in college. And I thought, you know, I need some more money here. I'm poor. I'm working these extra jobs, still don't have enough money. So 69 made 79 possible. And then 79 made 89 possible. I'm not talking about my age, I'm talking about the years, but in 1989, it was a huge decision to not expand the baseball magazine to include football but to start a new magazine. Everybody said I was crazy, but it was one of the the very best decisions I ever made. And then in 99, it's hard to not think that starting BGS was a huge turning point because it's been a big driver 
for uh, the company for my successors. So years that end in nine sound like they're, they're major decision, decision points in your career. Well, <laughs> maybe I put it on hold here, but no, 2009 and 2019, uh, that, that, that's still pending. Some of those things, Jeff, as happens to some of your other entrepreneur friends, is the recognition can be in arrears. Yeah. You make these decisions. It isn't always a big hit immediately, but you look back and you, you say that was a pivotal point. But in 79, I really did think, yes, I, I have made it. I have a claim to fame, something that I'm going to enjoy for the rest of my life. And it was true. It was great. Uh, so there were big news a couple of weeks ago, I know, or not even a couple of weeks ago, I guess a, a week ago. Um, obviously, you know, one of your legacies with Beckett was starting Beckett Grading Services. Um, and the company that you you know, would go up against and would fight for market share with PSA. The big news about them being acquired by a private equity group led by Nat Turner, who's a prominent card collector. What are your thoughts on that news? This morning's podcast of mine was about that, just 10 minutes, but it basically was looking at it from a bunch of different angles. And I'm hard pressed to figure out uh, how this is not a, a good thing. I mean, who's it bad for? You know, the shareholders, the hobbyists, the submitters, the, the bulk submitters, the, the uh, you know, dealers, collectors. Uh, I think it's good for the hobby. So I, I'm looking forward with uh, great anticipation to the new ownership. I'm glad they kept Joe Orlando in place. I think that's, uh, you know, I, I'm a little sensitive from my experience and some of my friends that, you know, when you come in and there's a, there's a buyout, sometimes there's some big changes and I don't think they're going to be big changes. I think there's going to be big innovations and big improvements with the energy of bringing in a very passionate and knowledgeable uh, owner who really cares about the category. I'm very excited. Yeah. I think it being, it being owned by a sports card guru himself is a great thing. And, uh, as you said, new energy, innovation, it can lead to that. Hopefully it will. That's, it's going to be really exciting. Uh, Jim, I can't, I can't help but notice the background you have behind you here. I know, I know what this is because I, I had the honor of uh, having dinner at your house one night. You invited me there and I saw just a little bit of your amazing sports card collection. I, you've got so many Hall of Famers that you've collected over the years. I'm curious, who are you collecting today? Well, my, my wall of fame that you're referring to is a bunch of slab cards up on uh, in, in my backdrop, and it's kind of spans around the room that I have them in. And it's probably a thousand cards. I used to do it by sport, and then a few years ago, I switched it to be just alphabetical by the person, by the celebrity, because my friends are not necessarily baseball or basketball or football. They're just sports fans in many cases. So that's worked, that's worked well. And so what I'm putting on my wall, what I'm collecting are things that would draw interest from not just the serious collector and not just the casual collector, but even the non-collector. And so I'm heavy on, uh, on uh, local interests, you know, people that, that grew up around here. And I certainly look for anybody that might ever knock on the door and check it out. Some of the local, uh, local stars. Yeah, it's it's one heck of an impressive collection, and it's neat that we're getting to see a little bit of it there behind you in that in that backdrop image. Uh, it it was really really impressive to see that. Uh, and and when I was there uh, visiting you, you were filming episodes of your podcast. I was able to appear on a couple of those episodes, which I really appreciate. And uh, for the for those of the audience who haven't listened to it, we're going to talk a little more about your podcast. It's been it's great, really awesome stuff every single day. An episode you put out recently that I thought was a very timely one for people to hear about, especially, as you said, a lot of my audience is into the modern cards, into basketball cards, is you talked about the fallacy of just kind of dismissing this year's basketball rookie class, which a lot of people seem to kind of be doing because they, they, you don't have the big Zion you know, type player who people are excited about going into this year. Uh, share your thoughts with the audience a little more on that. I know this is counter instinctual, but the hobby's been too easy <laughs> for the last six or eight months. I mean, the only decreases that we've seen are things that had so wildly increased before 
that you're still looking uh, smart uh, over the last 12 months. If every class is better than the one before, that sounds great, but that can't happen forever. So there needs to be this dynamic element if you're not sure what comes next. And so, and there will be a breakout star, whether it be a huge breakout star or not, we don't know that, uh, but there probably will be. And so this instant gratification that, that people have gotten accustomed to is not, is not healthy. It's not healthy. It's, it's, it, that's where the irrational exuberance comes in. So being in a situation where there's a wait and see, you know, then there's some, and again, that would be sort of speculation, but that, that makes people stop and say, hey, do I really want to pay the same as last year's price for this product or more when I don't see the value necessarily at this time? So uh, if people back away, that's not even a bad thing. It means the people in the industry are voting with their dollars. And that includes the card companies as well as the dealers and the collectors. Yeah. And, and you're right. You're first of all, absolutely. We can't have as hot of a rookie class as we've had every single year. But I mean, to your point about it being somewhat unpredictable, I mean, if you had rewound the clock, you know, let's say three years ago and you had said, three or four years ago, it should people have been more excited about the football rookie class of Jameis Winston and Marcus Mariota, or, uh, you know, the quarterback class that had, let's say, Patrick Mahomes uh, in it, right? I mean, people would have, people back then would have been, well, of course, you know, Jameis and Marcus and those guys are, you know, there was a lot more excitement about that quarterback rookie class than there was around Patrick Mahomes. And so you just, but, but of course, you know, Mahomes has emerged as this all-time great potential figure in football. So you just, you never know. And you can see that you've seen the same in basketball. You've seen the same in baseball. It's funny. I don't know if you've seen any of these clips, but uh, some people have compiled these clips of card breaks that card breakers did back in 2011, where they were flipping by numbered Mike Trout cards and, and had no idea who he was. Or 2013, where they were flipping by Giannis cards and had no idea who Giannis was, right? So, I mean, you know, you don't know where those types of players are necessarily going to come from. And maybe some of them are in this year's basketball rookie class. Who knows? Well, they, they probably are, but we don't know. One of the things you do that's, that's really, really good in your podcast, I'm trying to do the same thing, is to make the hobby, the industry, easier to comprehend. Having said that, it'll never be easy. If it gets, if people think it's easy and simplistic, they're, they could be headed for a fall. And so, but to make it easier and more understandable, I think you're doing an excellent job of that. You've, you've got a niche that you've carved out that's, um, well, you're, you're, you're going where the interest is. That's a really good thing. I feel like in my background, I was trying to cover the whole landscape and, uh, and I'm comfortable doing that and I'm spread pretty thin, but you're focusing on what people are really going for. I can only imagine what you went through back, you know, putting those Beckett price guides together. I remember your stories about staying up late at night and, you know, building all these spreadsheets of all this data. Uh, I, you know, I can only imagine what, what that was like. Now we at least have the benefit of computers and algorithms and, and, you know, eBay sales history to make some of that a little bit easier. But man, back then that must've been quite the process. Well, the people were saying to do kind of what you did this, you know, going back 40 plus years that, you know, just do, do, um, you could do a better job if you only do the cards that people really care the most about. And I said, well, I, I realize that, but if you do uh, every card, you're, you're going to give confidence in the whole industry that every card has some value, some more than others. And um and it's why on the fastest moving cards, they need other tools besides a printed price guide or even a, even some of the uh, digital price guides. Once it's, you, you, to be up to the minute, you've got you've to have data sources that are up to the minute. Yeah, especially with cards from the last few years, it's been incredible how dynamic the market has become. Good for me, you know, that that's that's obviously keeps people entertained and tuning in to the show and subscribing to Market Movers and all that type of thing. Um, I, and, you know, another speaking of, of, of cards and many, many cards, uh, the national, you know, obviously the 
cornerstone of the hobby when it comes to being able to go and just see an amazing array of interesting dealers and collections and cards and memorabilia for sale that seems to go on forever. Um, we're all hoping that the National is back in person as it is planned to be in Chicago. I, I want nothing more than to be able to go there and meet a lot of people watching the show and, and do some shopping myself. I thought your podcast uh, on that facet was interesting recently. You were kind of uh, theorizing about maybe there's the need for the National to be in more than just one city once a year. I, what, are, what are your thoughts on what, what an ideal future for the National could be? Well, kudos to you for showing that uh, part of the National or any show needs to be some of these uh, not webinars, but, but presentations and, and making people that are interesting in the, in the industry available in a format that people can, can uh, receive, whether they're there or not. I mean, your podcast was birthed in a corner of the national. Okay. So being there is important, but people who aren't there also care. So you've really moved toward that element of uh, any future national ought to have a virtual component. So again, hats off to Jeff Wilson. The second thing though, and the, the final thing is I, in the interest of moving it around the country, uh, and there's some different things that are controversial about raising some prices or uh, doing some things like that to make uh, more venues possible, but I'd really love to see it twice a year and rotate around. And I think it was twice a year. And so in my podcast, I used reverse psychology to say, let's do four times a year. <laughs> and we can settle on two. <laughs> so I like that. Two nationals a year, one in the winter, one in the summer, uh, the, the, and, and rotating them around uh, and, and probably reducing the footprint just a little bit, at least for one of them. Um, that would be great. That'd be great. And again, the virtual component. So I, I think we're going to have a national in Chicago and I think it, it could be the best one ever. I sure hope so. I really do. I was so excited about the one this past summer, but obviously, uh, you know, Mother Nature had other plans for us or whoever you want to blame for it. I'll just I'll just blame Mother Nature to get to stay politically correct here. Um, and so, uh, yeah, hopefully, um, hopefully so. I really hope so. But I love that idea. I think the more, you know, the, the more within reason, the better. I would love to see multiple going forward. I think the hobby, certainly right now, at least the hobby is hot enough to support it. Um, well, these, these topics obviously are, are the types of things uh, as well as so many other topics you're talking about on your podcast. For those listeners who haven't had a chance to uh, listen to your podcast yet, how do they find it? Apparently, it's hard to find. You know, I realize when I've been interacting with my listeners that I have zero unintelligent listeners. They're all smart. I've got a lot of other podcasters that's, that, uh, that listen in. And so when I get uh, correspondence from people, they're, they're thoughtful, they're collectors, and they enjoy the podcast because it's short. It's Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. And I told you, I thought about making it be about investing. And I thought, well, that's part of it, but that's not the whole thing. But Sports Card Insights, I give kind of my full name to distinguish between uh, that and something that's sponsored by Beckett Media. But, you know, it's a uh, it's, it's a daily uh, fun thing to kick out a topic in 10 or 12 or 15 minutes, keep it short and enjoy the feedback again. Like I said, I'm not on social media, so people don't easily find me, but when they do, they seem to stick around and enjoy the episodes. They're all uh, bite-sized chunks. So there's a kind of, you can see from the title what it's going to be about and you could say that sounds interesting or not. So not really doing it to build. I already built a company. I'm, I'm trying to never be an employee again and never have an employee again, just to be a regular <laughs> guy that's enjoying uh, having some voice. And so when people spread it out and share it, that's great. But, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's given me a chance to uh, record some oral history with some, with some uh, f really fun guests. Like I said, I, it, it, there's a lot of really sharp people in the industry and uh, so it's it's fun interacting with them. Been been a great great ride. And and you're and you're covering and you are covering such a wide variety, which is you know if someone really wants to educate themselves on 
on different years, different eras, different sets. I mean, there's so much wealth of content you're putting out. It's it's awesome to listen to. I'm I'm approaching 500. I just started. I'm approaching 500 different episodes if you count the the small ones. And and just let me leave it with this. Your your podcast is excellent. I'm doing my best, but there are many more than just two. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but you have your niche, I have my niche, and there's so many others that are, you know, I'm having trouble keeping up with all of them. I don't know about you, but there, and, and I can't get rid of the one because they're good. They're good. So again, we're, we're blessed in this hobby to have a lot of passionate people that are knowledgeable, that are willing to share their knowledge. I mean, podcasts in cool format because it's the, the base model is essentially free. Dr. Beckett, thank you so much for joining us again. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being part of the virtual holiday. Thank you, Jeff. Keep up the good work and uh, uh, blessings to you and your family. Appreciate that. Same to you, sir. Take care. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that interview. I certainly enjoyed being being able to interview Dr. Beckett. It's always an honor to have him on the show. And I would also be honored if you could download the Sports Card Investor app. If you haven't already, go to the app store on your phone and search for Sports Card Investor. It is totally free. And trust me, you're going to love it. Go download that now. I appreciate your ratings on that app, by the way. It helps uh, It helps the app get found when you give it a rating. So please do that if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to this channel on YouTube. Hit the bell icon. Or if you're listening on the podcast, subscribe that way because that helps us out as well. And we're coming out with new episodes every day this week, recapping the very best from the virtual. So we want to notify you as those hit YouTube. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. See you back tomorrow with our next one.